I think there's a few ladies back there. Are you wanting to go still? We're going to get started now. So we're going to head actually to a first. It's going to be more like groups of plants uh, that we're going to touch on today. So uh, there's some specifics as well. But the first one is actually right here. And we're going to get started. We got started late. Of course, the traffic was wonderful this morning, wasn't it? Uh, as well as I have volunteers that I'm, I have dual purpose person. So our first plant, and we'll see these a little bit later on, is one of the cult, uh, or one of the, the catmints, uh, Nepeta. And this is one, it's a touchy feely one. Mm, it smells uh, cinnamony, clovey to me. Uh, but this is one, this is Nepeta early, uh, uh, early bird. And uh, we'll see another one here up in, a, it's actually our second plant. But uh, this has only been flowering for probably a month or so already. And, uh, you know, it, it, this is one that's selected for its earliness. And so in May, it is typically in full bloom. And we are early this year on everything. So some of the normal things I'm going to ignore. So um, we're not going to look at a peony and we're not going to look at bearded iris. <laughs> no, no, we'll pass by some of those. But anyways, um, early bird is a great one for full sun. It's a partial shade even here in the south. I was reading about this selection. They say, yep, it prefers a little bit of shade in, this, uh, far, in the southern United States. But it's been in this spot, I'm going to say eight or ten years anyways. And it's done fine and dandy. Uh, but it, they do want good drainage to persist for us. Um, so as you're walking by this one, you want to get a smell. Uh, you know, I know Marilyn, she'll, uh, you'll probably counter me on this one. Deer and rabbits haven't bothered this one. <gasps> you know, there's actually several of the plants I talk about today. Deer and rabbits don't bother. And uh, this is one of those. So this is a safe one. Uh, but I, uh, what they were saying about early bird, about six weeks of flowers. It'll sporadically throw flowers even in the summer here. Uh, and, but if you shear it, it'll look a little fresher after it's done flowering um, too. But um, instead of being the rabbit shearing it, you can shear it. Um, but it, um, again, and then you get to smell it. Um, but it's a touchy-feely plant. And look how tall it is. It's just overwhelming everything around it. It's so tall. Not. Uh, it's only six or eight inches tall on this selection. There are other nepotes that are a little bit taller. Um, and we have some in the garden. Um, but uh, this is one of the uh, good ones here. Um, the next plant, like I said, is another nepotet. And you're going to see it. But this one, you might get a few seedlings from this, which is not a bad thing. So... Um, in this case, it has never been weedy for us, uh, and that will be slightly different. I mean, the the uh, seedlings will be different with the next one, but um, take a sniff as you go by this. And we'll see this probably in another spot in the garden, too, as we're walking around, so uh, if we get that far. This is, like I said, our second Nepeta, which this one, as you can see, this one, this is Nepeta uh, fascinii, uh, Nova Vent, uh, Nova... Nep June John Nova Nep John, isn't that catchy? Nova Nep John, I can't spit it out. It's the trade name is Junior Walker. So, uh, an old cultivar of Nepeta is Walker's Low, and apparently Walker's Low had a tendency probably to self sow, and I believe the story is they irradi irradiated some seed from it, and they got uh, th this 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 Nova ne Nep John. Um, and, but it's sterile, so this one doesn't uh, self-sow. It's a little bit bigger, as you can see, than the uh, one we just saw, the, uh, the early bird, uh, at about, oh, I'd say about a 12 to 15 incher now. But really nice spreading uh, habit, low flowers for a couple months again, in, um, heavily, and then you get sporadic flowering later on. Full sun again, partial shade in our climate, well-drained soil. So, it's a red. That's actually my next plant. And we're going to go to a much better clump. So, okay. um, so um, keep an eye out for this little one here. These are some ones that got mixed in apparently in the bag, which I'll talk about that a little bit too. But um, so anyways, any other, any questions about Nova uh, Neptune? <laughs> Yeah, around the same. I mean, this one's sterile, so it, it, it'll continue to flower. That will too, but it's not going to be as heavy. For, it's a good heavy six weeks, and then some sporadic flowering. And this one will have about a two-month flowering, and then it'll... Maybe a little longer. Maybe a little bit longer, mainly due to the fact it's not worrying about making seeds. Okay. So, 
here is the plant that you were just uh, questioning me about. And this isn't this a much nicer clump. That one's much smaller. This is Dicalostemum. Uh, and Ida May is the, uh, the species on this one. So this is a wild species from Northern California, uh, from, I read, Mendocino County and up into Southern uh, Oregon. Um, and so this, the dicalostemums, um, they've, they've, they've had name issues over the years and family issues over the years. Um, there's uh, now recognized to be about four species of them. Uh, so anyways, this is one of them. And then there's a couple hybrids actually. So, and we'll see one of the hybrids here in a moment. So, but anyways, this is just really cool. And uh, the flower color on this, this is a bulb. And it, the, I said about the family issues, or actually the, the, it's been lumped into, I think Brodia or Tritoletta a couple times off and on, but they split it out because of some hairs on it and some other thing in the flower shape and structure. <laughs> and that the stems twist a little bit on these or curl. Uh, so if you're a lump or a splitter, it doesn't matter. But then it's originally it was placed in the lily family, which everything used to be in the uh, lily family and the, mon the monocots. But then they put it into a couple other families. And then it ended up in around in the 90s in the Thymolidaceae, which was with the Brodia, Tritoletia, and then a couple other genera that I have very little knowledge of. Um, but then again, around the 2000, they, there was this really big uh, reorganization of families doing, using new technology. And they lumped it into the asparagaceae, which didn't even used to exist. And everything is now asparagaceae, I think, except for like half a dozen things in the lily family. So, but this is a really cool bulb. So it's from California. What are summers like in California, have you heard? Dry. Dry. So typically in the wild, this is uh, found on forest edges, uh, grasslands, coastal grasslands, and actually up into the mountains. Uh, but they have a consistently dry summer. It's a Mediterranean climate. So they're active through the late winter or the winter and into the spring. And as soon as this is done flowering, it will go dormant for the year. So it's spectacular right now. The foliage is just this strappy stuff here. It's really not that uh, um, interesting to look at, but Wow, that flower, uh, the, the color and the structure on that is just great, great cut flower. And I don't think anything, my rabbits have not eaten it anyways. And I have a rabbit problem here. I don't know about deer, but I doubt the deer are gonna bother this one either. Um, so really good one. And everything I read about Dicalostemma is it says, oh yeah, do you want a dry summer? Oh, our summer's dry sometimes, but we typically get heavy rain. So it will take our summers, no problem. This has been here, I think I, probably put this in here. I didn't look at the date on it. It's probably a 2007 or eight accession. I can't tell on this label. Um, so it's only been here for a, few, for a few years. The clump has done well, as you can see. So great one to work into your landscape. And we're gonna quickly just bump over here and we'll be back there in a second, but uh, just for about a month or so. Okay. But I love that color. I don't know about you. And it's every year consistently end of April and into May. So this one here is one that the, there's a cultivar name that they put on it, though it's a naturally occurring hybrid. Um, this is uh, Dicalostemum pink diamond. And family issues on this one too. Uh, they know that one parent is item A. There's three other species of, uh, uh, of uh, um, Dicalostemum, and they can't decide who, who that is second species is out of those three. It could be that little one, which actually I pointed out there were some oddball ones down there in that uh, first clump, which is probably um, Dicalostemum congestum, but it could also be Dicalostemum, uh, I think it's volubile or multiflora. So they aren't quite sure who the other parent is, but regardless of that, this is a great color. Uh, gives It's a, a different uh, from the red. You get this uh, striking pink and the got again the twisted uh, stems on it and it, again it's the same characteristics as uh, item A easy going in our climate uh, just give it good drainage and you can get a great show out of this this has been here just as long so um, uh, I just wanted to point that one out any questions about either of those what sort of pollinator does this attract I'm gonna guess with item A uh, it being it's in the west and it's red what do you think Hummingbirds, yes. And so, uh, but the other species uh, like that we saw down there are kind of a lavender blue. Uh, 
So, or pink. So this one, uh, I mean, a hummingbird did the crossing probably, but uh, the, the, that dyke, uh, item A is probably a hummingbird one. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if it goes after some of the others, but some of the other uh, uh, species have a shorter floral tube, so they might not be hummingbird pollinated as the primary pollinator. But for item A, it, uh, it probably is. And someone uh, made the cross. I don't know if it's a hummingbird or another insect or something that got in there, butterfly, and made the cross. And um, apparently this is sterile, so or nearly sterile, um, even in the wild. So in the, 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 the hybrid that they call it is venustum uh, when you see that. So, um, but pink diamond is what it is in the horticultural trade. Okay, and we're going to do a jaunt right back here where I was just at because I threw down a, a sample of something else to show you because it's hard to see it back here. And um, these are actually this was one that we got knocked over back in there and that's why I cut it. But there's a big nice one back here. Um, this is something we only they only last a few days. This is uh, Dracunculus vulgaris. Uh, and it's the common uh, Dracunculus, I guess. Which Dracunculus, there's only a couple species that are Mediterranean in origin. So these are the, the, the Mediterranean cousins of the Amorphophallus. Uh, and uh, you've got these really cool sexual organs here. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so you got this beautiful spath and the spadix here in the, the middle sticking out. Um, but coming into flower now, they have been upgrowing since January. And they're also very closely related to the aromatallicums, which are becoming downright weedy here in the garden. But um, this one's at least a much cooler plant. It does self sow a tiny bit uh, for me here in the garden. I do get some seedlings, but um, it has been well, fairly well behaved. The foliage, I don't know if you can see back here, uh, even before it flowers, often has white veins, which is really cool. Uh, so it gives you some added interest, but then you get those flowers and as long as you don't stick your nose in them whenever they are just open, you're fine. They only last for four or five days maybe, but the first day or so, it only smells like rotting flesh. So, um, and it is pollinated, so not by hummingbirds, but by flies. So, say the name again, Kim. Dracunculus vulgaris. Anyways, if anybody wants, it doesn't smell. If you just want to uh, see close up, you're welcome. You can uh, hold it. I, there's, there's some more coming on there, but this is a, actually a compound in fluorescence. It's really the actual flowers are, we're going to mutilate this one, are down here. This is just the antenna uh, to, uh, to distribute that fragrance. So down here are the female flowers. And then these are the male flowers. And I don't know if you saw the pollen that just fell off this whenever I did that. Actually, you can see the pollens right here. Um, that would then fall down onto the flower, uh, or the female flowers and pollinate it, so. Okay. So that ends this little section. <laughs> We're gonna head down uh, the pathway here to a couple different things. So in general, I'm just gonna point out a few things. Some of the early sages are in flower right now. And this is one, this is a salvia, probably Greggii. Uh, we don't list it as Greggii, but I saw other places are. This is one called Red Letter. Um, and we've had, this was in the Keller trials in 2007, then I moved it here. Uh, uh, either, I don't know if I moved it or if I actually used the extra plants. But anyways, it's been here since 2007 or 2008, doing great. And these are, I always laugh at the common name, they call them autumn sages. Uh, and um, they only flower, you know, from, depends on the year. They started in March this year, normally early April, and they do a heavy uh, flush in the um, April, May, and uh, June. And then when it gets hot, they, they, uh, they stop flowering a little bit, maybe for a couple weeks if it really gets hot and dry. Uh, and then they perk back up in the fall and flower again in the autumn. So you just get a couple months out of them, but that's a great one. We're starting to get into some of the salvia farinaceas and farinacea hybrids. Um, I forget which one that is offhand, but that is a hybrid one. Uh, it's not a straight farinacea, but we'll see some other ones down the, the path here. Uh, but uh, these are great for this time of the year as well as throughout the whole season. Um, uh, but uh, this is just one I'm taking note of here. And again, pretty dear and um, 
and rabbit uh, resistant, and as are the uh, 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 Dracunculus vulgaris. So, uh, is that one of them over there in the planter? Yes, that's a Dracunculus vulgaris. That was a seedling that I dug up that uh, that came up someplace it wasn't supposed to. Uh, I also put an Amorphophallus in there, which hasn't pushed up yet. So. And then this one here, this is the trade name for this one I do know. It's not quite out yet. This is a Salvia Garnitica hybrid. Uh, this is Rockin' Deep Purple. So this was in our trials several years ago and I planted the extras in here and I've loved these. So if anybody growing Salvia Garnitica, and it's a thug. This uh, black and blue or Argentine skies are thugs. They will take over if you don't let them, uh, or if you let them. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it a thug? Does it crow everywhere? Yeah. It suckers everywhere. This clump I've never done anything with, and it's been here since 2000, or it's been here probably eight or 10 years. It's gotten bigger, but it hasn't spread miles. It's only, the actual clump's only this big, so. And much better behaved. Pardon? What color? This is, uh, red letter is the, 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 the cultivar on this one. Um, but. But you can't go wrong with some of these salvias. And again, with their cousins the Nepeta, they're, they're resistant to most things for us here. So uh, we're gonna head on down here a little bit further. We're gonna ignore the irises and the peonies. If you were here last week or the week before, the peonies were gorgeous. The irises are even, uh, the bearded iris anyways, are a little bit past. They're not at their peak now, so. So right in here, we're in. We're just going to touch the perennial border. In reality, I'm going to take you some other spots. So uh, this is one area we're going to uh, go for right now. Uh, and what I wanted to show you here is one of the few penstone to me that does well long term here. It actually the, the individual plants are short lived, but self sows reliably. This is Penstemum tenuous, uh, which is a southeastern native. It's from uh, Texas to Mississippi up into Arkansas. Uh, so it's accustomed to heat and humidity and dampness. It's actually a riverine. It's found in riverine uh, ecosystems, and so it can take our wet soils. A lot of the Western uh, penstone that have really cool colors uh, don't like us here so much and are short-lived or just don't persist in the garden. Um, like I said, this is just a short-lived plant but self sows great. Um, and we can grow, we have our native penstone digitalis, which I have in other parts of the border actually. Uh, but it's just a palest, a pink, if you stra strain your eye, it's typically white. And um, I like the, some of the colors, but this is a great early bloomer for us. They'll be done here in about, a, 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 well, probably in a, a late uh, May they'll be done, but they've been going at it for three weeks already. So it's a good month and a half to two months of uh, flowering on this penstone tenuous, which you can see, it just, it self sows. Uh, it's an easy one to um, let mingle, and it gives you some really nice early color uh, in the uh, the garden. And I didn't plant, I don't think Doug planted that there. How did you get there? I don't remember. Does anybody recognize that plant? <laughs> That's our dicella stem, um, um, pink diamond right there. So, I, so anyways, I'll have to keep an eye on that one, let it grow in there. Uh, but it perfectly fits in this section, so Doug must have stuck some in here. I didn't realize it was still here. So anyways, that was, this was the key one I wanted to talk about here. But while we're at it, uh, we also have one of our native phlox down here in the foreground. This is phlox pilosa, uh, right down here. And there's a little bit over here. It can spread, we, at different times, it's covered this whole area. Um, uh, I've been renovating the border, but we've got it. In, uh, 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 so hopefully it'll start to spread again, but it doesn't take over per se. It, it looks nice at this time of the year and it'll flower for a good month or so, uh, maybe even two months and before it starts to peter out in midsummer. summer And it looks a little more tattered then, but um, who doesn't look tattered in our uh, summers? Uh, so. And another cool plant while we're here uh, is this Scylla. And right here, this is Scylla hyacinthoides. And I didn't do any research on this one, so I'm, I, I can only tell you a little bit. It's Mediterranean in origin, um, uh, but uh, it's a lot different than a lot of the other Scyllas that we grow. Um, but again, it's been flowering for uh, almost uh, probably three or four, uh, three weeks probably. But it's just so cool. It's not like the, the Siberian squill, I think is what they call uh, Scylla uh, 
uh, um, Siberica, which is only gets this tall, and um, or Arcilla Peruviana, which flowered last month, uh, earlier last month, uh, that we have down there. Again, it's shorter, uh, a very different inflorescence. We're also getting to crinum season, uh, starting early now with, um, I think this is, this is either uh, Cecil Howdy Show or a, a Poelii. Um, I don't remember, I think it's Cecil Howdy Show. So uh, he's one of the better ones that's been around for decades. And again, we also have some more salvia here. This is Salvia Farinacea um, Augusta Dolberg. Uh, Augusta, and I have her husband down, uh, down there, um, were found on a cemetery plot in Texas. Uh, so uh, that's where the names came from, the husband and wife. Um, uh, um, Henry is a uh, nice purpley blue, so. Uh, Augusta is the nice white one, but uh, that will flower the entire season. So it's, you know, it's only been at it for two or three weeks and it'll go until November. So not a very long flowering season for that one. <laughs> any other, any questions about anything in this area that I didn't point out or I have pointed out? I wasn't gonna talk about roses, but I'll, uh, this is one of my favorites here, this rad prov. Um, so if, if you want to smell a rose the way it's supposed to smell, smell that one. It, it's, an, uh, it's a modern um, floribunda, but they got the, the antique look to it, and I really like it. So, so we're going to head, actually, we're going to backtrack this respect right over here. So right in front of me, we have some hippie eastrums. Um, and this is one called al fresco. Uh, so what are hippie eastrums? That's the common name for them, yeah. So, yes, you can plant them outside here. <laughs> so many people don't realize that. And this is the time of year they flower. And now these have been, I mean, I think they go as far north as D.C. is what I've been told. And there's some species, there's a, a couple hybrids actually. I think it's, it's either, I think it's to the Johnsoni and uh, that might actually be hardy into zone six. But anyways, this is just uh, one of the modern double flowered hybrids and you can't go wrong with them at this time of the year. They are not that long flowering. That's the only thing for about um, two to three weeks uh, in um, late April and May, we get really good flowering on uh, hippie eastrums if you have them in the, the garden. And um, these are ones we got and Doug had had them in the, the containers in here, I, I think two years ago, when no one was here probably. No, it was in 2001 when people came back, but no one saw them. No, we opened up. Anyways, uh, they were in the, the white garden in containers and he, he threw them in here last year, I think. Uh, when, I don't think they flowered last year, but this year they, reco they recovered last year and they are just spectacular now. So, um, uh, and these have been at it for a few weeks. So what do they want sun? Uh, ideally full sun is gonna be great for them. Um, they'll take partial shade, but you'll get, uh, they may slowly go down and not flower as heavily, you know. Um, average soil, I mean, just so it's not wet and not soggy wet soil. The, I mean, hippie eastrums are pretty good. I mean, they can go dormant if it gets too dry, which is, you know, just like we grow them. But in the garden, um, they'll grow, be actively growing all summer long, uh, gaining tons of energy. And then uh, they go, they're forced to go dormant in, you know, November, December, whenever they, we have killing frost. And then they'll come back up in the spring and, and do their thing. So uh, it's just like us growing them as a house plant. In reality, you know, buy that dormant bulb, put it in a pot, and a few, three weeks later, you have flowers. So, <laughs> but again, deer, don't eat these. So this is a dual purpose talk. <laughs> Not as long uh, flowering though as some, as some of the other things I'm showing you this morning. So we're gonna now head over here, which is where I was heading a moment ago. Yep. Don't put it out immediately once it, you have to wait until spring if it's actively growing at Christmas or you could kill it. And don't plant it so shallowly. That was something I ran into a couple weeks ago with another plant. My volunteers asked me about planting some hymenocollis, which are kissing cousins of those. And um, they said, oh yeah, plant, I said, plant them like you would an amaryllis. Not thinking of a house plant amaryllis, planting as a garden amaryllis. Uh, so they put the hymenocollis bulbs pretty much out of the ground. It'll kill them. They said, could you put them back down in the ground further? So just have the nose right at the surface. The nose, the nose of the bulb right at the surface. So that's how you want to plant them if you're planting them outside. 
but inside you can have the bulb showing. So what I'm gonna show you in here, I'm hoping you see my blue flax here. So actually I collected this uh, a seed uh, in August of 20, one now, yes, uh, and just outside Moab, uh, Utah. This is a widely distributed species. So this is Linum louisii, uh, I, uh, which is found pretty much uh, the western two thirds of in North America. Uh, it ranges from Alaska and, uh, and it's down through Canada, the western U.S. down into uh, northern Mexico. So I didn't realize it had that wide of distribution, but I've seen it in. Uh, I think I've probably seen it in Wyoming, in Colorado, uh, New Mexico, and uh, Utah. Um, but I collected this at over 8,000 feet. So that just seems, baffles my brain here, that we can grow something that prospers at 8,000 feet here. Uh, I don't know how long it'll live, but it does uh, set for copious amounts of seed. And Tony Avent's been growing uh, a selection down at um, Juniper Level Botanic Garden. And I put these out last summer, they wintered over. I did lose a couple, but um, they've been flowering now for probably a month and over a month, well over a month. Um, and there were actually probably a month and a half or two, to tell you the truth, the first couple came out. But uh, they are most spectacular in the morning. Uh, late in the day, the, the petals will droop, and then they uh, drop their petals late in the day, um, uh, even later, early evening. So um, it, it's one, it'll probably want well-drained soils for us and full blazing sun to do best. Um, in our hot southeast conditions. So, but it is one we can grow. We do have our own native flax, but they're either small yellow things or they're not as spectacular. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and they blend into uh, with other things. Um, but this Linum louisii has actually been really impressing me. And the foliage when it's not in flower is that nice blue and it kind of almost looks like a, a small conifer. Uh, it's not that texture, but it, it, it has that appearance. Uh, so. It's just one I wanted to highlight in here. And uh, right behind it, we also have Amsonias, which there's a bunch of Amsonias. We have native Amsonias, and, but this is one that, uh, actually JC, I believe, popularized. This is Hebrectii, and this one has a specific cultivar, but any other Hebrectii are gr uh, typically uh, good, but they flower right now, just for a couple weeks. Um, you get that soft powder blue, um, uh, blossoms, but Hubrachtii is only native to when a, a mountain range in um, in, U, uh, in Arkansas, actually. Uh, so it's often called, I think, the Ozark uh, Blue Star or something like that um, is one of its common names. But uh, this one is uh, the name I was referring to. Something golden. I have to. I don't know if I can see it from here. I don't see it right now. But anyways, um, it refers to its fall color. One of my volunteers asked me the other day, now is that label right? Yes, it's referring to the fall color. I don't always get good fall color in here anymore. There's a caterpillar that we've been getting that it can mess up the foliage on them, unfortunately, that we didn't used to have. So, um, uh, but right now at this time of the year, the foliage is really fresh and, uh, and we have the powder blue flowers and uh, we'll see, maybe this year I won't have the, the caterpillar that destroys the fall uh, display on it, so. Uh, any questions about any of these, uh, so Marilyn? Can mere mortals get seed or something for that linum? <laughs> yes, you can find linum louisii. You can actually find it online. Um, and uh, it, it's, not, it's one that's readily available. So, uh, or you can go out west like I did and collect some. Um, <laughs> in a few weeks, I will have probably copious amounts of it here. I can see because all these little balls are... Um, seed pods, and there's half a dozen seeds in each of those. So, uh, any other questions? How long does it grow? Theoretically, I was reading online anywhere from March to August, September, it, but I don't know if it'll do that full period here. Um, that's over its extended range, but like I said, it's been going at it for two months already, or a month and a half to two months already, and it's still making buds. So even if I only get another couple more weeks out of it, I'm happy. Okay, so let's see, where am I gonna go? We're gonna go way around over here now. So we're gonna look at this. There's, these are some of the beardless irises in here. And I just realized the other day that Doug didn't map them and I don't know what it is, I have to figure it out. Um, 
that that darker purple that um, we have this is an iris virginica over here uh, and it's Carl Amason uh, I don't know what the dark purple one is this is a uh, this is uh, Carl Amundsen is not a Louisiana iris, but it is still a beardless iris. Uh, but this is a Louisiana iris over here, Dixie Deb. And it's just spectacular right now. Um, I, I'm per starting to fall in love with these rather than the bearded iris, which can be a little bit, um, I mean, they, they break off so easily. These are a little bit, um, they're very forgiving. They'll take flooding, they'll take drought. They, uh, uh, I mean, they're native too, so, um, or hybrids of natives, so just spectacular display right through here, and you can see a variety of them. We do have a whole bunch of other uh, irises in the uh, garden right now too, but uh, again, Louisiana irises, in our border uh, over there, you'll see a couple other Louisianas in, uh, in flower, and I don't remember their names offhand, but there's, there's one, it's an, a red. It's an orange, or, or purple tones and orange tones in it, and it's red. I always love that one. And then at the far end, there's some spectacular blue ones in pur uh, purple shades. But so much variety in the Louisianas in particular, but also our native Iris Virginica, uh, which is more purple. It's m similar to that, but um, over there. But uh, this is Carl, who is more of a, a lavender pink uh, shade of uh, that he is known for. So. But again, they can be a great plant for a hard spot uh, because they are drought tolerant, but they will take inundation when we have bad, uh, heavy rains. And hence we've put them in the rain garden here, which was started in uh, 2020. So, uh, and, and uh, uh, Dixie Deb has uh, just done a, a, a little bit of filling in here and <laughs> is downright spectacular right now, especially if you view her from that way, this way in the morning, so. Um, and again, we have our Nepeta. This is our early bird again. Uh, so as I said, and these, these were, haven't been flowering as long because they weren't next to that wall. And that was a kind of a little bit of a heat island. So this is still, these have been going at it for probably um, over a month uh, and looking great. So um, any questions about this area? Are you going to share... Dixie Deb, yeah. we um, we yes. could. On the, on the plant card. Yeah, we actually she's a leftover from a plant sale in in 2020 when when we in in, in the COVID era, uh, and <laughs> so we had some of her in the the plant sale then, uh, in our first uh, crazy plant sale that was online. So. Uh, and that's how she got in there. I'm sure we can we can find some. She is needing in some division. So, so we're going to head actually a little bit over in here into the rose garden real quick. Oh, I take that back. I'm going to stop right here. Nephophias. I don't even remember what this one is. They, they actually this has been self sowing. So. Um, the, the, the fofias in general are really great at this time of the year. Um, April and May are probably the peak time for them, though we do get them the uh, selections now that flower often on the entire summer. Um, but this is one of the, the larger ones, and I don't know where its label has gone, but I just want to mention the nephophias. And again, I don't think deer bother these too much, and my rabbit population <clears throat> hasn't done anything to them either. So they might build a nest under them is my worst thing, because um, they, they do do that. But um, you always get some really cool colors out of these, uh, being that they are self-sewing in here. We got both the oranges and yellows uh, combos in here. And I like, I like the Nephophias that are a little bit taller. The modern hybrids are making them shorter and shorter, and that just doesn't give me the same feeling when I look at that. So um, I like the more majestic tall ones, but um, we'll have other ones flowering through the season. Um, the soil in right here is not that great. Uh, they'll take clay. They're not going to want a, 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 a sandy soil, but the, uh, just a really good, any good soil should be fine. Um, but um, like I said, these have been multiplying in here and I haven't done anything to them. Um, we have other ones throughout the garden though, uh, and I have a bunch more to plant. So, and, um, so anyways, Nephophia is a great one for this time of the year. And later on, we'll have Lola in the perennial border, but she's later. But I don't trust any of those, of those apps, to tell you the truth. Other than to say it's an iris, 
blue flag is about as general or generic as it comes. <laughs> um, anyways, this here is Phlox Amethyst Pearl. So this is one of the earlier flowering hybrid Phlox uh, here. And I don't know, is that what I'm smelling or is it the Dianthus? No, there's not much fragrance to this one, but anyways, um, this is a counterpart to anybody who has ever anybody heard of Phlox Mini Pearl, which is a white form, uh, very similar to this. This is a, a, a newer hybrid uh, counterpart to that. Uh, fits the same um, description. Uh, nice spreading uh, Phlox, early flowering. Um, if you deadhead it, it will repeat some throughout the season, but never as heavy as it does at this time of the year, and. These have just uh, exploded into flower the last two weeks. <laughs> Excuse me. But uh, uh, these, oh, I laughed when I looked at the description, or the names online. They're saying this is a paniculata, and this is not a paniculata. Uh, ignore that. It's probably a panic, it might have paniculata blood. I'm guessing some maculata in there. But uh, it's a hybrid phlox, um, very vigorous, because you can see how it makes drifts in here. We did plant a bunch of plants, but still, um, it's a great one for filling in. Uh, a 10 year old clump, of, or not a 10, a five year old clump can get about three feet wide. So, of an individual plant on that one. So, it is just a great one for this time of the year. Wonderful cut flower. This one is not rabbit and deer proof, in my experience. Though the rabbits haven't been bothering it too much. Uh, deer tend to love uh, flocks. So, uh, if you have a deer problem, this might not be one for you. So this is another of the salvias, and this is another, this is a Greggy eye. There's a whole series of them now uh, in this group. This is, um, let's see, if I can find my, uh, what I, uh, I can always look at the label. This is salvia balm for Balmirabi, Balmirabi. A lovely name, isn't it? It's Mirage uh, Rose Bicolors, the trade name for this one. There's a whole Mirage series. They're fairly compact Greggy Eye uh, salvias. And uh, this one, I hadn't paid attention to the last couple years, but this year it has really taken off. It's, this is, I think, second, this will be its second full year, probably uh, third year that it'll have been in here um, overall. But, um, uh, Anyways, it's just taken off this year and it looks spectacular. Uh, I wasn't so sure about some of the, uh, the newer salvias when we first got them, but uh, this one is starting to impress me and I just wanted to point that one out as we make our way over there. So this one's a little tattered right now, but still it's coming into flower and it's unlike some of my other Spercilius, so. So what we're looking at here, it's a little tattered because that one was out over the rain, but I don't know if you can see, there's bud here, bud here, bud here, bud here, bud here, bud here. Um, this is Sperculia, and then this is, um, let's see if I can see it, Homocissima uh, Lowdown. It's a hybrid Sperculia, which was often called the Aztec lilies. Um, it's a cross between Sperculia Howardii and um, Spercalia formosissima, which is the common one, uh, which has been grown. I have formosissima in the garden and they don't flower worth a hoot. These have just been planted for a couple years and I get more flowers uh, on this than we ever got on the formosissimas. Um, it's a very vigorous hybrid and it'll repeat flower from anywhere from April and into the fall. Wow. We'll get repeat flowering on it. So, um, I just been, I saw that and it's coming into bud. I was hoping some of these would actually be open this morning, but with the cool nights, they didn't open yet. But um, just a cool uh, Aztec lily um, to grow in your, uh, your landscape. And again, deer resistant and rabbit resistant. So, um, but it's an early starting one. And this was a perennial talk about some earlier things, uh, early, late spring, early summer stuff. So, um, I just wanted to mention that one. Uh, any questions about anything this morning? Are, are these gardens irrigated? Only a small fraction of it is uh, automatically irrigated. I have a lot of stuff like this. There's no irrigation here unless I run a hose. I do have some sprinkler heads that will irrigate that border over there. Um, I can put sprinklers and stuff in a, in a few th places, but most of it is not irrigated. The lath house is irrigated. So yeah, most of this is what falls out of the sky unless I get really desperate. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, I guess that is our tour for the day. Thank you, Jim.
You're welcome. And then now I get to go, oh, and I did it in just a, under an hour. And now I get to go work the volunteers. <laughs>